Um, hey everybody. Hi there, Mark. I just got an email from Dr. Robinson that he doesn't have connection info for the meeting. Be Paul Robinson. Yeah. I'll go ahead and resend it to him. Okay. It's been resent now. So we don't have a quorum yet, it looks like. Uh, hopefully Dr. Robinson gets on and then we'll have four and we can start. In the interim, I guess we'll just wait, even if the meeting started once we get to sit. Okay. Hello, hello, it's Taylor. Welcome, Taylor. Hey. You also have Karen Gallagher, so do you have your quorum now? We do now with four. with one minute to go. Good job, guys. <laughs> okay. So I'm on the phone, but I'm also watching on YouTube, so I'll be able to see. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you everyone for being on. Thank you for joining us. Um, going to call to order this um, meeting of the Sustainability Committee of the City of Tarpon Springs this Thursday, July 16th at 6 p.m. Can we please get a roll call? Chairperson Larson. Present. Vice Chairperson Robinson. He's I just now connecting into audio. If you I give him a second. Connecting. Mr. Mandalu. Here. Ms. Menino. Here. Mrs. Gallagher. Here. And uh, Mrs. Sanger's not here yet. All I read right. he just called my name. I'm here now. We got you. Okay, good. 
Very good. Um, our next item is the approval of the minutes from the June 18th, 2020 meeting. We all had a chance to take a look over those. Are there any uh, questions or comments? And if not, then I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Um, the next item on the agenda is the review of the Board of Commissioners input from the 623 Board of Commissioners meeting. And if it would be all right with everyone, I'd like to suggest that we uh, move up items um, four and five, the presentations to this point in the meeting so that we can free up their evening and they don't have to be, <laughs> be with us as long. Um, so if, if someone would please make a motion to that effect. I'll make a motion to move up the presentations and switch the order of tonight's agenda. I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. All right, so um, I will go ahead and hand the floor over then to Bob Robertson, Project Administration Director, to talk to us about some grants um, that are sustainability-related projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director, and I'll tell you about that uh, department in a second. But first, thank you for moving this up on the agenda. This is my third after hours meeting of the week, so I, my family is grateful, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Robertson, See you again on the screen. It's uh, twice in a week. Yep. Lucky you. Lucky me. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for uh, inviting me to come talk tonight. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you all. Uh, just real quick, the Project Administration Department, if you haven't heard of that department, is um, kind of functions as a de facto engineering department for the city. We're an internal service department. And we manage all types of projects uh, from roadway to drainage to um, uh, to building improvements, um, anything that, that the capital pro projects the city does, we're probably involved with it. And um, so one of the duties that uh, I was uh, voluntold to take care of as a, 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 a dutiful department head to the city manager was grants tracking. And uh, that's what you've asked me to come talk to you tonight about. Um, before I get into it, I don't have a PowerPoint, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to show you a spreadsheet that we use to track grants. And I've highlighted some that are uh, related to sustainability. And before I do that, I, I want to um, express my gratitude to Ashley, who is the, the jack of all trades for our department for public services and project admin. She does a great job helping uh, and tracking these grants uh, for all the departments in the city. So Ashley, thank you. Uh, credit to you for that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll just talk about some of the grants. Um, I'm thinking of this in discussion style. So if you have questions as I go, just please uh, let me know. We don't have to wait till the end and um, we'll, see, we'll get right through it. So I'm gonna share a screen here. And uh, please let me know if you see a spreadsheet on the screen. Yes. I see a couple nodding heads. So, all right. So what you're looking at here is a, um, it's a living and breathing spreadsheet. I hate that term, but boy, it sure is. Um, th this is a, a, a multi-page spreadsheet, and I'm going to walk you through here in a second, but we use this to, to track um, current or active grants that, that, are, that are, we're currently using or they're nearly completed. And there's a, a section down here of future grants, or ones that we're applying for, have applied for, or will apply for. And then there's a, a kind of a summary at the end of, of, of the total status of the grants. But I'm gonna start back up here at the top. And we're gonna start with some current grants here. So uh, I'm gonna highlight a few of them, the ones that are in yellow here. Number five here, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a grant um, through the Cultural and Civic Services uh, Department. Friends of the Library is the granting agency. So money from the Friends of the Library donations account is used to support uh, special projects. And um, I'm highlighting a, a couple that they do at the library with this grant money. 
they, um, they give away these grab and grow kits which are uh, little, I guess, planters that, um, that are uh, giveaways for, for folks to plant their own, I think it's herbs, like an herb garden. Uh, Ashley's not, nodding, I think, yes. You all disappeared, I have no, no people on my screen. Um, just a sound check, everyone is still there? Yes. Okay, thank you, I, I, no one's yep. on the, I'm not seeing any images, but I'll just keep going. Um, and then they also have these, uh, have a seed library uh, for plantings and all that is paid for through the Friends of the Library donations. And we consider that a, a grant because it has um, a monetary value. Bob, are these um, annual or is this for the whole project? I, I think this is an ongoing type uh, grant. Um, Ashley, do you have any other information on that one? I do not, but I could definitely find out for you guys and let you know. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think of that one as an ongoing one. And just so I can get my screen back, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a second here, and then I'm gonna bring it back up again. There we go. Now I have all your faces on the right side. There we go. Okay. If you, Bob, if you look at the top number one AARP, what is Art of Health? I am not familiar with that one. That. I mean, that grabs my attention. I'd like to know more about it. Sure, get some more information about that one and we'll get that to you. Thank you, sir. Sure, no problem. Um, so I'm gonna stay focused here on the yellow ones, but yeah, by all means, if you see one you wanna ask me about, I'll do my best to, to give you some more information or if we don't have it, I'll, I'll provide it to you later. So number 17 here is, um, in yellow, the public works. This is one that you're probably very familiar with. This is the electric vehicle plug and play program that um, that I was involved in last year and a little bit the year before that, uh, through which um, Duke paid for the installation and handled and managed the installation of uh, five charging station at stations at four locations, <clears throat> total of 10 plugs, estimated value about $5,000 each. And, um, and we get monthly usage reports. I, I know Ashley gets copied on those. And uh, unfortunately, the numbers kind of went down with COVID with, with people staying home. But um, we do monitor that and we get, do get those. We do keep track of those. Um, the next one is a, is a project uh, through the Public Services Department. It's a grant from the Water Management District, Swift Mud. Uh, through their cooperative funding grant program. Uh, this is a uh, $10,000 grant with a $10,000 match for a total of $20,000 through which the, we are providing rebates for folks that are changing out um, toilets to low flow toilets to help, for, to help encourage water conservation. And um, I think at our last check, we were at about 40, 30% utilized on that, Ashley, if I'm remembering right. Um, I know that we had 30, I think it's about 30%. Yeah, okay. So, you know, the word is getting out and, and people have been calling and, and um, taking advantage of that program. So that's a good one, we like that one. <clears throat> one of the bigger projects that was recently completed, number 20 here, is a, a reclaim water expansion project in two neighborhoods through West Winds and Grassy Point. Um, this one was funded by the Water Management District uh, providing $297,000 where we had to match that. Um, that number is, that's actually not right. Um, our match was quite a bit higher, but because um, it was a, a over a million dollar project, but um, we got, we did get this $300,000 $300, to <clears throat> encourage that project. That one has been com completed and, and people are continuing to hook up to reclaim water, which is a great resource and certainly helps with the water conservation. So that's, uh, those are the highlights for the, the current projects. Looking into the future here, getting out my crystal ball. Um, <clears throat> talk about number 32 here. This is a continuation of our water conservation. We call it water conservation phase two. It's a water management district grant and uh, we're gonna continue the toilet rebate program. 
but we're also going to add in uh, um, some giveaways, uh, water conservation kits, and educational information. These kits include um, low flow shower heads and um, some other goodies uh, to help encourage water conservation and just knowledge of conserving our resource. And this is another $10,000 grant with a $10,000 match. And I'll move down here to number 37. This is a big one. This is um, a flooding abatement project on the sponge docks. And um, for this one, the, the granting agency would be the state of Florida. And the way we've uh, gone about trying to apply for this money is through a, a state senator, uh, Senator Hoover, as a matter of fact, help support and sponsor a request for a budget appropriation from the state. And you see that's a big number. It's $1.7 million. The scope of this project is, is pretty big. It's changing out some of the stormwater infrastructure that, that uh, drains towards the sponge docks and installing a stormwater pumping station. Um, the first one, it would be the first one of its kind in the city. Um, and uh, that $1.7 million is not money that we have in our, our stormwater utility. So we've asked the state for help. We asked for it last year and we're denied. So we're gonna try again this year. And uh, looking at number 39 there is a DEP grant. It's a resilience planning grant. I understand this, uh, this committee is going to be involved uh, as part of its year SAP uh, to, to prepare or to request funding for a shoreline vulnerability assessment. I don't know a whole lot about this one, but um, I, I imagine that you are familiar with it or Paul may be able to add something to that one. Yes, I can say a little bit. This is a $75,000 grant that um, we're looking to apply for in August, and um, it's due by October. I'm hoping we can use this as part of our vulnerability assessment in a similar manner that we really liked what Sarasota did with their vulnerability assessment. Something like that, perhaps with broader scope. Um, 75000 isn't a whole lot of money to do hard engineering work, but I think it would put us in a position to at least have our initial priorities. So that's the idea there. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. And then the last ones I'm going to highlight here, these last four are ones we recently applied for through the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, and this one, the first one here, number 44, uh, is the Rebuild Florida Critical Facility Hardening Program. And we've applied for money for wastewater treatment plant dewatering building structure hardening. Uh, this is a building at the, um, the, the end of the wastewater treatment process through which uh, the sludge is, is dried and, uh, and uh, processed for trucking out. It's, a, it's an important function of the wastewater treatment process. And this building would harden that, this project would harden that structure for um, heavier wind conditions. It's a $1.8 million um, request requiring a $180,000 city match for a total of a $2 million project. Another one for through that same program is also, also at the wastewater treatment plant. They want to look at um, the operations and control systems building where a lot of the ele electronics are and it's also where the, uh, the employees work concept is to add a second floor to mitigate, mitigate against flooding for emergency events, uh, seeing that wastewater treatment being a, a critical function for recovery um, post, post a storm, for example. Mm -hmm. This one has identified as a, as a $2.4 million project with 10% uh, city match and a, a $2.1 million request for grant funding. Uh, number 46 is uh, also from the same program. This one is to support the reverse osmosis water facility. This is the drinking water plant. Um, the idea here is that the, the water division has a fleet of portable trailer mounted backup generators. And uh, those are used for multiple purposes for not only um, the drinking water wells, the wells that supply the reverse osmosis water plant, 
but also for wastewater loop station. Well, the idea here is that we would like to try to install permanent generators um, instead of portables at the water supply wells, um, which would thereby free up some more of those portable generators to be used at the wastewater lift stations. And just kind of give you an idea. We have, um, I think it's 17 uh, potable water supply wells that, that feed water to the RO plant, but we have almost 60 lift stations uh, that pump wastewater to the wastewater plant. So you can see we have to be flexible, mobile, and um, to be able to respond, we have to have to be able to generate power and electricity at those places that, that need it for these pumping stations. So the idea here was to, to install some permanent power gener uh, backup generators at the water supply wells. Uh, $730,000 total, $250,000 city match, and $480,000 request. And the last one here is, um, the Rebel Florida General Planning Support Program, the uh, looking at a, a wastewater utility resilience plan to create a vulnerability assessment with specific recommendations that um, to that assess risk and in critical infrastructure, uh, to develop a whole list of, of project options to address physical upgrades at the wastewater plant. This is sort of just to capture the ideas that we weren't already acting on, like the 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 watering building and the um, operations building. And here they're asking for a $270,000 grant. So when you look at all these combined, just to kind of roll these numbers up, um, to give you an idea that the total project value for which we've applied for grants citywide or are going to or have applied recently in the, in the past years, almost was just over $10.5 million, um, applying for $7.3 million of grant funding of that 10.5 Look, looking at about 69% uh, grant funding for these projects. So you can see obviously how important grant funding is to the city's capital improvement program. And let's see, this is this stuff is, uh, that's old stuff there. So um, that's a pretty relatively quick rundown of some of the, the uh, sustainability grants and I'll stop there for questions. Bob, can you throw that back up again? I, I would like to highlight number 41 on your list because it does directly um, relate to the work that the committee is doing. So 41, um, we just applied for this. Um, it's a small matching historic preservation grant for an adaptation and resiliency plan for the National Reg Register Historic District as well as the Greektown National Register District. So um, just stay tuned with us on that. We'll see, well, hopefully we can be successful in, in pulling that one in. And certainly um, uh, we'll be definitely be working with the Sustainability Committee as well as the Historic Preservation Board through the development of that if we're successful in getting that grant. Thanks, Renee. And, uh... This just in from uh, Karen Lemons talking about the art of the the art of health. She sent me an email that I will uh, I'll share through to you guys. Uh, there's a flyer through Tarpon Arts. Um, let's see if I can. It, it's a new new free community event called the Art of Health, tentatively set to debut in November uh, November seventh. The events will highlight the unique ways the arts impact an individual's health and well being. From a veteran's PTSD to a student's academic achievements to the positive effect of dance on those with autism or Parkinson's disease, to the burden of stress which adversely impacts people of all ages, the arts have played an important positive role. This event will educate and celebrate it. The inaugural event is co presented by Tarpon Arts, Advent Health North Pinellas, and Peace for Tarpon. There we go. Thank you, Karen, wherever you are. That sounds interesting. Any other questions? Stop my share there. So if we are applying for multiple grants with like DEO, um, is, does that lessen our chance of getting, if we getting one or getting, and are we prioritizing them? Is there any way of doing that? Or you just apply for them and you get what you get? I think, I think this is kind of a, an open ap application process. There are some that work the way you're saying the, the uh, Swift Mud grants work that way. They ask you, 
to prioritize the, if you're applying for multiple grants for the in these for these I don't think we were asked to do that Ashley do, do you recall having to prioritize when, when we submitted these applications I don't remember having to do that um no I don't remember having to do that I know we had yeah. a number of them but I think that was about it yeah I don't think so And I'm looking, I'm just trying to, I, I tried to make a running list as you guys were, as you were talking. Um, so the shoreline vulnerability is an assessment that we would help to, I guess, prioritize where we would want to then, I guess, where we're most vulnerable and what we would want to do to mitigate that, correct? That's correct. I see some follow on work. This would be sort of an initial screening. And um, I think we could get a lot done for that grant amount. And then is the historic plan something similar where it kind of maps out what's at risk and then what we need to do to mitigate? Exactly, um, especially with respect to historic structures. So what are, you know, what are their best practices and, you know, how do, you know, how would we best position ourselves to, you know, maintain those structures for the, for the long haul, given the, the low lying areas like the fruit salad district and places like, and as well as Greek town. So. That would be good to be, to know all of these vulnerability uh, across the city. Um, another question, I guess, do you guys have any sense? I mean, obviously, the state's budget is, <laughs> it is, what it is right? being severely impacted. You know, um, is there any word that they are going to be funding all of these projects, or with the budget that was released ago? That's Bob, really hard to say. I, I haven't heard anything other than we, we know that some of the appropriations we had asked for were declined, like the dredge of the extended turning basin, for example. Um, but as far as I know, the invitations were open and we didn't want to miss them, so we put them in. Yeah, also I can say that um, Ashley was participating in a webinar as recently as yesterday or the day before on that coastal grant. So they're proceeding in earnest. I would think if there was a bad sign, they might do an announcement already. I think the, the DEO grants, if, if I recall, those were, they, that money flowed down from the federal government, did it not? The, through the CDBG mitigation process. Um, I believe. Yeah, and, I think you're right. I think. Yeah, right. and so that that money's there. So it's going to be a matter of how they get ranked and and the money doled out. Okay. And well, then has this another question? Has the city looked at any um, opportunity for CARES funding and being able to use that for any of these emergency preparedness uh, efforts? Not to my knowledge. Well, I can say this is just this week we've been for the city manager submitting our costs related to COVID. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but yeah, uh -huh. we have to get some funding at the county level for the impacts that we've experienced at the city. Okay. Because I my understanding is there is some funding through the CARES Act for like resiliency projects and things that would that help to harden. So that may be something that, that we should be looking at. You know, yeah, and maybe maybe that's exactly what Renee's, Renee's talking about. Maybe that's how it's gotten filtered through. Uh, I think it is. Yeah, that this, the DEO is the caretaker of the CARES Act funding. Maybe I don't know. We can we can we can look into that for sure. Okay, because I think there was something through HUD. Um... And, and that that is the CDBG mitigation grants. Yep. Okay. Uh, Bob, follow up to the question I asked you Monday night. In addition to CDBG mitigation um, grants, there are also BRIC grants available through FEMA. This is a replacement of the PDM grants in the past, but unlike the PDM grants, these are a 6% allocation of FEMA's budget uh, across the board. So they will be available um, grants up to 20 million each. And this stands for building resilient infrastructure and communities. So if the state doesn't come through, that might be something, uh, another place to go look at for money. And those are through FEMA, you said, right? They are correct. That they are they are through FEMA. I'll have to look. Yeah, I was tuning into. Um, it might have been something Dory sent, but there's a series of webinars being put together on that program. And I've uh, tuned in um, Renee as well. 
so that we can see what that BRIC program is all about. Good. Any other questions? Well, then hearing none, thank you so much, um, Bob, for coming and thank talking you. to us, sharing this information with us. Really appreciate you taking time past the five o'clock hour to, to be with us and to help us understand this better and how we can um, be tapping into these resources. So thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Have a nice evening. All right, and our next item on the agenda then is to have um, Renee Vincent, our planning and zoning director, talk to us about land development code and comprehensive plan um, and how we can incorporate sustainability into that. So then hand it over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to uh, to come and talk to you. Um, I've only been back a couple of months, so I'm still trying to wrap my arms around everything again, but um, I was able to put together a few slides, so I will um, I'll share my screen. I'll attempt to do this. I haven't done this yet, so hopefully um, this will work. Um, so do you see, like, this is actually in a PDF, but does, are you seeing the uh, the first page of the? Yes. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Just need, <laughs> need some confirmation there. So. Um, you know, it, from from my perspective and in the planning world, I, I kind of come at this from kind of three levels, you know, as to how what what we can be doing at the city, um, looking at things from you know, from a global, a local and an individual perspective. So, you know, at the global level, you know, what what is the city's contribution to solving the larger you know problem of climate change? Um, if, at the more the local level, you know, what is our local mitigation response to the effects of climate? So we've just talked about a lot of these things with the grants. So what are we doing to prepare ourselves, you know, to, to weather that, uh, those impacts? And then, you know, what are we doing and how can we best prepare our residents to weather those shocks and stressors that are associated with those events that are coming about as because of climate change? And so, you know, you know, in the immediate future, there's, I see three really big opportunities for, for the committee to engage with us. Um, we are past due. We really need a, a good conference plan um, overhaul or update. Um, the land development code similarly is pretty dated and is in need of, of a refresh. And then um, the special area, the, the spot docs and CRA regulating plan, which is that, that's the smart code based or the special area plan for the sponge docs and CRA. That's been in place for a while now, and it's definitely due for a refresh as well. So, looking at the comprehensive plan again, this is you know, this is kind of a long term. You know, this is my kind of my best swag right now of not having you know, a ton of thought into this at this point, but probably major up updates that would take eighteen to twenty four months. We we have a lot of data analysis this, that needs to be updated. The existing policy was really need to be reviewed um, and where we can do consolidation because there's a lot of overlap. So to try to make it a more functional document and understandable. Um, what new policy development do we need? Um, the existing elements need to be updated. We have opportunities to put in a new element. We may want a sustainability and resiliency element. Um, and then I really want to be able to structure all of that stuff around some very, you know, some major unifying principles. I apologize if you're hearing thunder in the background, but I'm in the middle of the storm down here. So, um, but structuring the plan around some major unifying principles, certainly sustainability and resiliency would be one of those principles. Some other things that I would like to be able to consider would be healthy communities, you know, strong local economy. How do we get attainable housing for, for everyone? So won't read through all of them. Um, I'll make this available to you, but trying to, again, just organize, reorganize the plan around those, those, those principal elements. And then the plan itself then provides the policy guidance that we need for the updates to the land development code and any other regulating plan that's out there or ordinance um, and codes. So the land development code, just, you know, again, kind of some, some big ticket items that I think, you know, need to be uh, reviewed and addressed. 
Uh, we put in a pretty pretty robust tree protection and preservation ordinance um, many years ago. I, I think we need to evaluate, is that really getting us what we want? Um, do we need to maybe look more toward trying to establish tree canopy coverage standards? So are we getting what we wanted out of that ordinance? Um, so I think an evaluation would be good there. Um, just again, looking at our shoreline and wetland, wetland buffers, um, you know, are, is what we have now working? Do we need to reevaluate those? Um, looking at, you know, do we want to require solar in some instances or at least provide incentives? You know, one of the trade-offs is, you know, from a, when you're trying to promote development from an economic development standpoint, trees have got to come out. And so maybe, maybe one of the offsets for that is if you're putting in solar, you get some credit back on, on your tree removals and things like that. So just, you know, looking at kind of all options there. Um, do we want to start requiring, you know, electric vehicle charging stations for certain types of developments? Um, sod and grass alternatives. We had, obviously Florida, you know, uh, Florida friendly landscape is, is good, but I think there's some opportunities there to look at, you know, just the overwhelming amount of yards that is just soaking up water day after day. Um, encouraging local food production. Uh, do we want to do we want to maybe consider going ahead and go into base flood plus two for that two foot freeboard again, anticipating future sea level rise. Um, I think the county did go to plus two or, or are considering it. Um, increasing wind load requirements. Uh, you know, the Miami-Dade standard, while it's onerous in terms of what it cost, the offset there is that those office buildings and things like that, you know, and commercial buildings that are built to those requirements, they know they're gonna be there. And so they don't have any problems offsetting those construction costs through the lease increase lease payments because the businesses that operate in there know that they're going to survive. They're going to be there the next day, you know, the, you know, after that, that major event. So, so how do we find some of those win-win scenarios when we're trying to promote economic development along with, um, you know, with what can be costly code requirements. Um, and then the last thing um, the, that I talked about was the, the, the transect based infill code, um, the, what we call the smart code. Uh, that covers the sponge docks and um, the the CRA. There definitely are some low lying areas um, in that in, in those geographic areas. Um, you know what are again kind of what are our best practices to promote infill and redevelopment um, in the context of you know we, we have to be able to you know to 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 plan for sea level rise. Um, the current plan, as I said, is based upon the SMART code, and there's so there's a whole there's several modules that have already been drafted that are out there. And they plug into that base smart code. And I think some of them are fairly interesting. Um, there's a light imprint stormwater manual uh, piece. There's a dark sky uh, uh, module. There's a sustainable urbanism module. There's a flood hazard mitigation, natural drainage and zero net energy building. So I think all of those are really interesting things to explore as we, as we you know, go through the process um, to update that smart code at some point in time to integrate those into, into that document. So, you know, that, that was the, that was what I could come up with here, uh, kind of, you know, on uh, mm -hmm. trying to, between trying to get my head wrapped around everything and prepare for this. So I'll stop there and answer any questions um, that I can. Uh, Renee, the, um, the information in the land development codes on trees sounds on paper pretty good, sounds pretty strong talks about using uh, shade trees and evergreens, uh, specifically hardwoods and evergreens. Sure. Um, and yet we've had situations in which the city decided uh, or the BOC decided in, in renovating streets in downtown to use palm trees instead. So how do you strengthen the codes so that you know they have some teeth? Um as well as strengthening them to have teeth is, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, I hate to throw that back as a, as a policy decision of the, of the board, but I really think that it is certainly, you know, part of the challenge that we face with, with street trees, um, especially in, you know, in the built environment that we're living in. Um, unfortunately, palm trees are a lot less invasive underground with, with utilities. So there seems to be a, an affinity to go to, you know, to not cause problems. Uh, but I think there's some opportunities and I think um, doing a, like a demonstration project of, you know, how can you plant, you know, 
shade trees in structured soils and things and you kind of contain them so that they don't interfere with um, you know with your utilities and things and it's you know they'll they'll get to a point where they won't grow anymore but the, so they they kind of become like I hate to use the term like street furniture that you're, you know you're going to have to replace them occasionally but but it but it, you do get you do get a better opportunity for shade in some of those instances so um, I have I've casually talked with um, our arborist and um, you know and Tom Funchen and you know and I think you know, I think they're open to trying to find find a spot where we can maybe try to do a demonstration project on or for something like that. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's the best thing. <laughs> Sounds like a good way to proceed. I really appreciate your uh, presentation, and it seems that there is a a lot of crossover between what we're talking about in envisioning a sustainable future and what you presented to, to us tonight. So I see that there's a lot of opportunity for cooperation and collaboration. And hopefully sustainability will be on the front burner when it comes to future developments, uh, future projects in the city. And um, I was going to ask about the trees as well, because it, 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 we want tree protection to be more than just uh, lip service or something that could be, trees could be removed if you have enough money to uh, pay for uh, the permits or whatever. I mean, hopefully we have a more overarching um, idea of, of the value of of tree cover and canopy in the community and indigenous landscape and so forth. But I really appreciate the presentation and I hope that we have a lot of more opportunity to overlap what we're, what we're working on with uh, planning and zoning. No, I, I appreciate that. And it's, you know, it's having, having this actually having this committee you know, is, is, is so good for, for what we're trying to do. I mean, a lot of times we just get, you know, you, if you don't have, you know, an organized body out there that's kind of pushing things, you know, for you, you know, us as city staff can kind of, sometimes we can kind of get lost in the, in the fray. So I, I think, um, you know, having, having that, having this board as a, as a good sounding board, so to speak, for these types of things, when we're looking at changing our codes um, is, you know, will be extremely helpful for us from a policy development standpoint. I wanted to um, thank you, Renee, for this presentation. It's really uh, helpful to visualize where you guys are planning on going and, and to see it. Um, and I also want to kind of give some context for your leadership with this previously, because I don't know if everybody realizes that you were with the city and really were the like architect that helped um, and showed a lot of leadership in getting the smart code um, and a lot of the sustainability that we have already in our comp plan and that was through your work. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, and also having your perspective, having worked at the county, I think that that's gonna be a tremendous um, asset to helping us plan this going forward. So just wanted to give everybody that, um, that, that, that context of we've got a fantastic resource and you helping us, you know, helping the city do this. Um, I have a question. The first slide that you showed, it looked kind of familiar. Those um, component, not first, uh, and again, next one, next one. Oh, that one. Third. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't counting very well. Um, where, that looks really familiar. Is that like, it looks like um, some other. That is the, that, yeah, that is the star uh, rating system okay. for, yeah, for resiliency. And that, um, that rating system it was, I, I suppose, trademarked. Um, you know, I, when I was at the county, we actually we got STAR certified before the U.S. Green Building Council then bought this out. And so they, they own it now. Um, but the tools are all there, whether or not you're STAR certified or green, you know, it's such a, it's an extremely good jumping off point for evaluating um, and setting benchmarks for where you want to go. So you don't have to do all of them and don't pay any attention to what's highlighted in blue. That's just the way the graphic, you know, was when I co-opted it off of the internet. Um, 
but it gives you, you know, so that climate and energy module, you know, those are things that can help us set some benchmarks. Um, that's one of the other things that I really want to be able to establish in the comp plan um, are some, some, you know, some meaningful benchmarks and measures so that we know maybe when we're hitting maybe some success, success in the future, because it's, you know, w without that, we don't really know what kind of an impact we're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that those are kind of familiar topics that we've seen also looking at other sustainability action plans. Those are like just ways that you would group um, actions together. So that's, that's good to see that visual. Um, and I guess my next, my other question was just how do you see us interfacing with you in a helpful way? Like, how do you see us going forward where we can be able to provide input in a, in a constructive way? I mean, I, you know, it would be my intent that, you know, certainly as we initiate these, these projects to, you know, to come to the, you know, to this board, you know, early and often um, on on all of these types of projects to get your input um, up front and along the way. So I uh, will try to, you know, keep a, you know, a, I'll work with Paul to maybe somehow keep a, a dashboard or something, you know, available that, you know, or update, you know, on a, a routine basis of some of the, th of the things that we're working on. And, you know, and then if something, you know, that maybe that you weren't aware of, or you want us to come back and speak specifically on, just, just let us know. And, uh, you know, myself and Pat, and I'm in process of hiring another planner. So we will, uh, we'll, we'll be there. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? I had, I had a uh, quick question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it really gave me like kind of just a, a view and it's good to see that there's a lot of like resiliency and climate type things in your guys' plan, but um, I saw the thing on just grass and sod alternatives, and I was just kind of curious about that. What's a, what are some of those alternatives? Um, it, some of it is just you know ma in making sure that or ensuring that you know simple things like you know it seems like you know we've got two kinds of grass. You got what St. Augustine and Bahia, but you know they're even doing things like you know seeding with clover as an alternative through with your lawns you know um, those are nitrogen fixing and they they they're much more resilient so you know i'm not an expert in it i i just know that there's alternatives out there so it's something that we would definitely want to research um you know as as part of our you know allowances at least or encouragement in the land development code for the types of acceptable ground covers and things like that so um, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would want to try to go so far as to say, you know, we wouldn't allow grass anymore, but that might be a little, little too much. And the HOA is not kill us, but, um, <laughs> but just, you know, something I just kind of wanted to be able to explore more. No, it's a good point, Renee. And it doesn't have to be anything really um, radical. You know, we're talking about mulch beds, uh, rock gardens, those kind of things that are very attractive, but uh, don't take near the water. Right. Or indigenous landscape, yeah, probably. I mean, it, you know, we don't want water rationing to be something that happens, but right. you know, when it comes to the priorities, that has happened in some places. I lived in California where that that occurred, and um, it's difficult, but um, you know, you want to avoid it if you can through having. Um, uh, the landscape not be a primary drain yeah. on your water resources. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that Florida Friendly Landscapes, they like they have a program and uh, you know, native plants that are around here, they're just they use less water more more times and they're better for the biodiversity of everything around. So I just had a question about that, but that yeah, that seems good. Um just as a personal note we replaced all of our turf grass around our house four years ago with sunshine mimosa as a ground cover, uh, twin flower is another ground cover, and the rest is all Florida native salt tolerant uh, and drought tolerant plants. And other than not needing fertilizers and, and as much water, we've also been blessed with hummingbirds and bees and butterflies that we didn't previously have. So it, it pays dividends. And what were those two things? Sunshine mimosa, what was the other one? 
I'm sorry? You said Sunshine Mimosa, and what was the other? Uh, Twin Flower was another. There are, um, we used Wilcox, which is a uh, nursery uh, in Largo that uh, specializes in Florida native plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did all our landscaping and suggested all our plants, and we're still working with them. But nice. it, it's, been a, it's been a blessing, really. Very good. I'll add to that. In our yard, we um, have a big patch of sweet potato vine and <laughs> another patch of beach sunflower that I ripped up from the side of the road before they widened Keystone. So, <laughs> repurposing. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you again, Renee, for being with us tonight, your time and talents, and uh, looking forward to good things to come. Thank you so much, I appreciate yeah, thank it. You. All right, so our next item going back up would be to review the Board of Commissioners input from our 620 or from the 623 Board of Commissioner meeting. Um, I'll just go through and Paul, please jump in and add if I have left something off. Um, the, the presentation overall was um, really well received by the commission. Got a lot of um, positive comments about the direction that we have uh, started and, and where we plan to go. Um, Specifically, Mayor Alahousis was very complimentary. He said that um, sea level rise is a priority for him, um, that we're at four feet elevation and um, that that is a concern. He wants to um, ensure that we are aware of the stormwater programs that Public Works has already undertaken um, and the pumping stations that, um, that um, Bob Robertson talked about tonight. He also wanted, uh, wants to take a holistic approach um, and make sure that stormwater action is incorporated into the sustainability action plan. Is there anything that I missed there? Okay. Um, Commissioner Carr, um, also complimentary, wanted us to look at um, capital improvement projects that would be um, costly to the city and to um, look at a five-year planning um, so that we're strategically uh, making recommendations for priority projects with the sustainability action plan. Did I categorize that accurately, you think? Okay. Um, Commissioner Donovan uh, also said that he's looking forward to see the final product. He was asking about a timeline. Um, and I gave him 18 months. Um, I probably should have said two, maybe two years. Um, but um, he also reiterated um, the appreciation for the work that we were doing, mentioned that he was at one of our meetings and spoke about how to um, engage community um, with perhaps cleanup activities um, and business recognition for excellence and sustainability. I think that that was the, the gist of his comments. Um, and then Commissioner Vatikotis um, appreciated our science-based approach and specifically talked about how it's kind of a nice contrast to the art um, committee's uh, approach of, you know, that yin and yang. Um, he said that, um, that we've made quite a bit of progress in, in the time that we've been together and he appreciated that. Um, he also is eager to have us look at the land development code and the comprehensive plan review, which um, was put in our uh, charter that's required that we have the 2021 um, update to the comp plan um, in hopes that we can be in on that. And um, Renee's presentation, Renee of Vincent's presentation tonight helped to um, uh, inform how we would in, uh, engage there. So that was good. Um, and I think that that's mainly it. Any questions or comments about that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Dory, thank you for um, the presentation. I, I didn't watch the whole commission meeting. I, I, I try to, but I don't always get to, uh, through all of them. But I did have the opportunity to watch uh, when you presented. Um, and so thank you. I think you did a really nice job presenting that and um, representing everything that we've put together. So um, I think, you know, kudos, nice job, nicely presented. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, I was watching, oh, sorry. Um, I was watching and I saw it was really encouraging just to hear that they're all, it seemed like they're all on board for it and really excited to see what we're doing and what we have coming. So that was just, I thought that was encouraging. I agree. All right, any other comments on that item? All right, then our next um, item on the agenda is to continue our discussion on how to engage the community. And I'm gonna hand it over to Paul, if you don't mind to talk about the, the document that you created and give us a little more information about that. Yes, thank you. Um, so everybody hopefully got a copy of the agenda. There's a flyer in there, a one page flyer. I have to say the PDF scanning process didn't do the background justice. What it's supposed to be is the same hands on the globe that we've got on our website. I think it's a really nice picture sort of screened into the background. But this idea came from our discussion last time and I think Karen Gallagher had a suggestion that everybody really seemed to like and that was doing an intriguing question capture people's attention and put it in the form of a flyer and perhaps have a series of these asking question, did you know? And then follow up with uh, the answer based on those different areas in our introduction of our sustainability action plan. So um, I don't know if I have it here to bring up. I think I will try to find it while we're talking, but I'm going to turn it back over for comments and um, I'll see if I can get the document and bring it up. Well, thank you for putting that together. That's it's funny um, when my 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 thought on on this was very different than what you produced. So it was kind of interesting to see what what came out. When I first was envisioning this, it was a did you know you know, and this was the forty six miles of shoreline in uh, the city of Tarpon Springs. My my thought process was, and again, that was just kind of on the whim, but um, was taking me down like actually more ex explaining the 46 miles of shoreline in the city, like giving more information on that, like to include X, Y, Z. And then um, I didn't even think of using that as a, like, um, it, it was more of educating the community of, of, on what we're doing, but it was, it was, I liked the, I didn't think of the information that you put in here. Um, so it, it kind of made me think, of, um, I, I, I mean, I, I like this, I think this is important, but if, I think if all the flyers come out, um, it would, for me, it would be more intriguing to have a little more information on the did you know portion, you know, maybe like an, even another sentence or two that just said, you know, uh, where, the, what, where the shorelines are, like including your bayous or your river or things like that, because um, it just gives, so to me, it just, um, my, my thought on the did you know was a little bit more in depth on the question itself. But then I started reading through all of this and there's so much re really good information in here because it is a did you know, hey, did you even know we had a sustainability committee? <laughs> you know? and, if, and, and yes, we do. And guess what? This is what we do. So the information in here is super, super important. So it's kind of funny how, you know, I, I totally went one direction with it when I saw this, I was like, wow, that was so not where I was going with it, but it came out really well, so. And I felt that it was a, it was a, a tasty little appetizer to the things that are to come, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I felt if you, if you go too deep initially, people might zone out. So I thought it was, it was just perfect because it just gave everybody just a little bit of, um, brain food, you know, for what we're going to share with them later and, and keep them 
curious, you know, because if, if uh, I'd, ra I'd rather people be curious than to feel like, oh my God, this is too sciencey and I'm going to meh, turn, it, turn it off. So I love the idea, Karen. I think that it's so awesome. Just the whole, the question, did you know? And then keeping it light the first time. I think in the future, it's gonna be, you know, zeroing in on each point with a greater depth is, is necessary for uh, people that are really interested and who get engaged through the initial process of asking that question. But um, it was nice and light, um, didn't put, wasn't something that would put anyone on the defensive, but just keep them interested. So I liked it overall. And that was a great idea, Karen. That was a lovely execution, Paul. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I like, I like the amount of material that's in this, but to me, there are two disconnects here. Um, the major disconnect for me is that happens in the middle of the page. We say the sustainability committee has identified several areas of urgent focus associated with climate change. And then we list eight areas of urgent focus. Then we jump to join us. We need input from our community to make our plan better. If I'm looking at this as a citizen, and you just told me we have eight areas of urgent focus. Then you asked me for my opinion. Uh, and I back up and say, wait a minute. I want to know more about these eight areas of urgent focus. So if we want to put this much into this one page, I would take the join us uh, sentence and I would put it at the bottom of the page. And then I would, if not explain, step by step each of these urgent areas with one sentence each, I would at least refer the citizen to a specific place where he or she can get more information on each of these urgent areas of focus. But the first disconnect to me, to go back to the top of the page is, it's very catchy. Did you know there are 46 miles of shoreline? Wow, I didn't know that. And we've got a sustainability committee. Well, if I grabbed their attention with that, then I would limit this whole page to shoreline and sea level rise. And I would make it very basic and very catchy and, and, and fill them with information about the significance of that amount of shoreline and what sea level rise is coming. If we're gonna have a series of these, I wouldn't put too much material on each page. And I wouldn't disrupt the thinking or the flow of thinking by asking their opinion when clearly what we need to be doing is educating them first. I, um... I already spoke with Paul a little bit about this because I, as soon as we saw it, um, I, I was just curious about how this would, how this is going to work. And I apologize, my dog is going nuts. And I don't know if it's a storm or if he thinks it's dinner time, but um, <laughs> back up there. Um, but I, I think the intent is to create a flyer about each of these topic areas, and I think that it would be um, good to maybe. If, if we do want to take anything out, then maybe we would just take out the urgent areas and just, um, and just make a flyer about each one of them. And then each week we would put out a new one um, with uh, the digital version of it. And then also, I think it might be great to have um, each of us or the people that worked on those components make a quick little video hey, did you know? And then you're basically kind of reading the flyer so that if people aren't as um, able to, to read in English, um, maybe they could, um, we could have that little video clip that explains it. Um, and then it might be kind of nice when we pull everybody, um, if we do have some um, 
virtual meetings to kind of poll people what which one of these caught your interest which one are you concerned about and you know in a way of getting some feedback there because i think that you know to these different aspects are going to speak to different people and and, and some people are going to think that you know public health is really important and somebody else may think the financial impact is really important so um so that would be just I, I just wanted to kind of clear, clarify that that I think the intent is to make several of these each with um, one of the focus areas that we had identified as a, as a reason of, of concern. Another thing you could do instead would be to just list the, the areas of focus, not ask for input now. Um, or if you do ask and put it at the bottom of the page, not in the middle and then direct people to the website, you're doing that anyway, and specify some information about each of the focus areas at the top of the website page so that there's a continuity between this flyer and the website. If you say to people, well, we're planning outreach in many different ways, articles and newspapers, surveys and suggestions, virtual meetings, um, I would say we can give you more information. Do you want to know more? If you do, go to this one place and we'll explain what we're talking about. So I got a pretty good di diverse input. I'm hoping I can bring it into a, an action. Can some, can I get some help on that? Um, I heard several people talk about, let's focus it on the one area and do several of them on the different areas. And we can do that. I can tell you one of the end uses was going to be putting it in the utility bills. And there is a pretty good cost with each one of those. I, I wanna say somewhere on the order of $800 each time we do it. You know, it goes out to perhaps 10,000 accounts. So um, I think that would tend to lend itself to an all-in-one document approach versus multiple ones. But again, I think a good, good outreach program will have many different ways and avenues. So we could have different products as well. It doesn't have to be one flyer for our whole message. So I'll put it back out to the group and, uh, you know, you all let me know. I'd be happy to redraft it. Is there a possibility of um, starting a database with inter people who are interested and want to give their emails so that we can send information to them regularly on what's happening? I mean, is that something that is possible even? Because we're talking about a lot of people. You said do you send this out to 10,000. The utility bill goes out to 10,000 accounts. But electronic versions or electronic versions of this to the those who are truly interested is going to be two things. Sustainable, because we're not using paper every time we're sending something out. And we are um capturing the target audience that we that has the interest in what we're doing so maybe um just getting to that point join us we need input if you would like more information sign up for sustainability uh, for once a month sustainability email, you know, just so that people don't feel like they're gonna be bombarded every day with something in their inbox and um, have a place where we collect the emails of interested people. Just a thought. Yeah, I could talk to Karen Lemons. I don't have any experience with email mailing lists from the city, but I think she does that with her economic news newsletter. So um, I can see how that's done. And I mean, if it works properly and it's not a big 
um, time drain, that's certainly a low cost and environmentally friendly way to do it. Well, you could do both. I mean, you could explain each of these focus areas on the website right at the top of the page. And you could offer people email information and you'd get different people at each, or you might just get complimentary information for the people who are most interested. That's true. I, uh, Not everybody might be uh, connected. So maybe I'm just gonna say, I, I do like the idea of this as like a, uh, like a first kind of introduction to you know, potentially a series on these. And uh, I think it would be a good idea to put a little more information on the website. I haven't checked it in a minute, but just to have like just bullet points of each one of those, just to kind of redirect be like, hey, if you want to learn more, go to the website and then explain a little bit and then put out some more detailed, did you know papers, either in the bills or online or both um, over time to just kind of explain a little more. I don't know how feasible it's going to be to have like a monthly newsletter. Um, I, I just think that that would be just speaking from that's part of what my job description is. And it's it's a time commitment. Um, I think that we should be looking at a mailing list just with the sole purpose of letting folks know this is when the meetings are going to be where we're having public input and then and use it just to communicate. This is when the virtual meetings are going to be taking place. Because I think that's the intent still is to have um, virtual virtual meetings for public input and to be able to have a presentation that explains the you know the the similar to what we did with the commission educate them on the the rationale of why it's important what the plan is intending to do um, and then we need to narrow down these you know we need to narrow down the focus areas and that's really where we need help from the public is to um is to help us focus on the those priority focus areas which are not necessarily the, the reasons for urgency that are bulleted here right those those are not not the same thing so i wasn't um, thinking of a newsletter on a monthly basis as much as just asking for feedback on particular aspects uh, that we're looking at, um, give a little bit of information and then just ask for some input. Just like it says at the bottom, you know, that contact the city uh, public services with your ideas and questions. So, you know, I wouldn't want it to be too complicated either. I think that that's going to just alienate uh, people that might be curious and um, want to be involved, but might, you know, we don't want to be a, it, the whole thing to feel like too much of a commitment or too threatening or too over their heads either. So, you know, we, I mean, what the, I was just thinking of it as an alternative to doing an ongoing publication in the um, utility bills because of the expense, because of the paper, you know, that we could just do another, did you, did you know, and uh, give some education and we'd love your feedback. You know, just some, keeping it very simple. So are you suggesting that we leave the information in this first flyer to that which is relevant to the 46 miles of shoreline. Just talk about shoreline and sea level rise and make it simple that way. Um, that would be, I think that that would be more focused. I mean, if you wanted to just start with, with the concept of what we wanna do, just make the first point shoreline and then say that the sustainability committee has identified areas of urgent focus starting with uh, the 46 miles of shoreline. Uh, if you wanna learn more, you come to these scheduled um, meetings 
or contact public services. You know, I mean, just, I didn't think that this was bad at all. I think that the whole, the uh, flyer, the way it is initially gives an overview. But after that, maybe if we're sending it out um, virtually by, you know, to at least people that have responded to this, we could I'd go through each thing point by point. Okay, I think I think the are... overview is best, you know, giving an overview to start with and then then going point by point. I'm a little lost. I'm not sure quite what you're saying, Denise. Well, I like the way that this uh, leave it to shoreline and sea level rise, but then you just said you like the overview. So I'm right. I'm... I, I apologize. I, I um, think that it's a good idea if this is going to be printed for all of, you know, to go out with the utility bills, it's better that all of our identified areas are printed out. And this is something that people can save. This is something, I mean, a lot of times when we get stuff from the, from in with our utility bill, I save it. I leave it on the dining room table for a while. I may put it on the refrigerator, but something that I am referring to for a bit of time. And this would be a great thing to give people a uh, reference that has what we are doing in introducing us and then inviting them to participate in the meetings and contact for ideas and questions. And then, then subsequently, with emails, we can continue to update the people that are actually interested. I'm gonna say what I said at the beginning. I like the content of this, of this page, but if I, as a citizen, look at this and you tell me you've got, if we tell them we've got eight urgent focus areas, but then you don't explain it and you ask for my input, I'm puzzled. What exactly are you telling me and what exactly are you asking me? Is this an informational piece or is it a request for my opinion? I think it needs to be more specific one or the other. I think our responsibility as a sustainability committee is to educate the public first, to tell them what we think is most important and then later ask for their opinion, not to do both at the same time. And I think the simpler we can make the first one the more likely we are to capture people's attention. Can I just offer something? Okay, so this is completely different from everything. I don't know, I'm just kind of sitting here listening to this. Um, and I go back to my original comment that I'd be, in, I'd be super interested to know how many people in the city of Tarpon Springs know that there's a sustainability committee uh, <laughs> to begin with. I'm, I'm hoping more and more people are learning that. But, um, what if um, I'm going to go completely rogue on this one? What if what if it was? Did you know the city of Tarpon Springs has a sustainability committee? And then underneath it, um, you know, with where it says shoreline, you know, it was like you add a little bit of information on the sustainability committee. But when it says shoreline, did you know that Tarpon Springs has 46 miles of, of shoreline um, within its city limits? Did you know by the year? Fast forward, because I'm just thinking off my feet, sea, sea level is expected to rise by X amount. Did you know? And then the heat index. So just one little line with each of those little things. And then it goes into, um, you know, uh, we, we need input from our community to address these issues. Um, join us at, you know, join us even on our, our virtual meetings at this point or what have you. Um, give us information. Again, totally rogue because that it keeps some of that same information there, but then it, again, it, it gives people a little bit. A, it tells them we have a sustainability committee, and this is what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to put this action plan together and what have you, and a little blurb about why it's so important to Tarpon Springs with our shoreline and stuff. So, okay, now I'll stop because Paul, I really do think you did a great job with this. So I'm not asking anybody to overhaul this or anything, but as I'm listening to um, you know, everybody's input, all of it's great. Like it's great 
information. It's great input that's being put out there, but you know, okay, we're a sustainability committee. Is it really um, in everybody's best interest to put um, a piece of paper in 10,000 envelopes every month? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that, you know, it's not very eco-friendly right there, but, you know, so I, I just, in thinking, in thinking about that, that, that's where I, that's what I'll offer. I like it. I think it's a great idea. So we got two different questions. One is what's going to be on it. And two is how do we get it out there? So I'm hearing a lot of people, and it makes sense to me that the bunch of paper on a sustainability committee, maybe that wasn't too well thought out on my part. Um, does everyone agree that we want to use perhaps electronic means instead? Um, I have one more question, I guess, because I, I, I think we also need to, to decide, are we, are we going to have actual meetings scheduled where the public, where we're just seeking public input, where we kind of give information about the plan of what we are intending to do, why it's important, similar to with, with the commissioners, but then set it up also to seek information about what is important. I don't think that people need to be area experts on any of this. I think that we need to lay out choices because I've been to these kind of focus meetings that were organized either by the um, extension agency and also by Forward Pinellas. And you like put stickers on what is important. And then you go in those groups and you hear a little bit more about that. Like, I think we can make the meetings engaging like that and be able to solicit public opinion on and, and help us to form the planning document without having to make people feel like they need to be a subject area expert because no one is. I don't, I mean, there's very few of us, like, you know, very few folks are really, and I don't think the average citizen is, and that's not what we're asking. We're just asking them to put value placements, I think, on what they are prioritizing and what they think we need to prioritize as a city for our action plan. So are we going to have those meetings and, or are we just going to, I don't see how we can have input without having those meetings, I guess is my yeah, the, point. The latest information I'm getting, and of course everybody's making predictions, but we're probably looking at the first of the year before we could be out in the public uh, in meetings. Um, that's at least one interpretation I'm getting. So perhaps five or six months away, I, I'm getting a sense that we don't want to wait that long to make some progress on getting community input. So I think we want to have an initial communication out seeking input back non in person, but rather through submitting something some way or other. Um, what does everybody think about that? Well, we could have a virtual town hall too, or a virtual listening session. That was what I was thinking. I was not thinking in person at all. Okay. You know, I still like, you, even though this um, flyer, the initial flyer, and I love what Karen shared. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, the initial flyer, I think, really needs to be um, worked on so that it can go into a utility bill. My, my, the re but then from then on, no, you know, that we, we try to engage people electronically. But I think if we don't do that, and we don't, you know, we're, we're um, at risk of a, a whole segment of our Tarpon Springs resident population not being included. And um, I think we, we all have the luxury of assuming that people have com computers and are, are totally connected, you know, but age, and poverty are two things that really make it impossible for a lot of people to be included. And I would hope that, you know, maybe we can um, at least do the first one so that, so that people can, even with their, with their phones, because most people have phones, no matter what income level they're at, they can try to engage somehow if they're interested. But I mean, do you have any other ideas of how we can engage everyone initially 
with this information other than to send it in the bill that everybody gets? Well, we got those three bullets, um, articles in local newspapers, and these were ideas from the group. Right. Uh, surveys and suggested boxes and areas of the community mm -hmm. and the virtual meetings. Yeah, uh, that would be good. But to answer your question, I think, Denise, um, if we want to ca capture as many people's attention as possible across the demographics of the community, then you put the first one in the utility bill for sure. But then you give them an easy way to follow up. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the problem of lack of access to computers may be significant. Um, but I think we need to allow people to learn more about this information at their own pace and on their own time mm -hmm. so that they can get information from our website or we start a Facebook page and they can get information at the, on their own time, whether it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. or whenever they're, you know, they happen to want to look at their electronic media such as it is rather than rather than depend upon virtual meetings i'm not against giving virtual meetings i think we definitely should do them i think we'll get a broader demographic involved if we let people come to us either on the website or preferably on the website plus a facebook page or something like that mm -hmm. as the follow-up can y'all hear me Yes. Hello, this is, I'm sorry to, to join late. I was having terrible computer challenges, but uh, it's great conversation. Um, I, I, I am thinking this through and it seems that the, uh, an initial outreach in the utility bills would be the way to go so that it goes out to regardless of income or demographics or whatever, uh, that's pretty accessible. And then perhaps on an, in that say that we're looking for the, you know, the red folks in Tarpon to be, be part of this as we go forward and mention the website and maybe have, uh, say if you're interested in doing in, in sharing your views, please go to our website and have a survey on the website that might be open for you know, a couple of months or something like that and then collect that data of people that with their three, uh, you know, ask them to give their top three issues that they're interested in or something like that, or put them, prioritize them, um, a survey monkey or something like that. And that data can also be collected. So it wouldn't just be a one and done. People could look at this, like Denise said, have it on their fridge and say, you know, what, I'm going to check this out when they have time. But to give people that, that flexibility to jump in as they're able and uh, collect that data over a longer period of time rather than, than you know, maybe start with that. Do we also include some old school type approaches at the library or something? Well, you know, the library I think is, I, I haven't been to the library actually for a long time and that used to be one of my favorite places. So I, I don't know from experience who's going to the library or whatever, but um, it could be something, yeah, I, I don't know what the library looks like these days. So it could be something that's on the, of course, on the desk at the library or um, maybe a flyer of it at the drive through for when they pay the utility bills or some something that just catches people eyes, people's eyes. And, uh, I, you know, it, it's, um, I like the idea of did you know, but to me that might be down the road farther or, or, or having something um, like on the electronic city sign, just say, did you know Tarpon Springs has 46 miles of shoreline? And uh, then put, you know, www.sustainabilitycommittee.org, whatever our, our website is or something like that. Just several, several different avenues is what I'm thinking. So I, I agree. I think that several avenues is good. And I think that we're all kind of coalescing on the idea of uh, the first 
did you know? Um, and then with the, we have a sustainability committee instead of the 46 miles of shoreline, just to make sure that people are aware that that's, that we're here and we are starting to form a plan. Um, and I think that it's good that that goes in the um, utility bill as a primer. And then um, I think that it's good. I, I really like the idea of getting some data collection from the website um, and putting together kind of a list. And I also wonder, in, like to Paul's point of being a people being able to, to view it in their own time. I mean, I think that the presentation we gave to the board of commissioners is a really good synopsis of like what we're doing. So exactly. maybe we can get that video clip or that, you know, the 15 minute presentation, the YouTube, that, that section on the, our page and say like, this is what we're doing. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, for the actual meat and potatoes of the document, we need community input. And then here's the survey. What do you think is important and have those, you know, different options listed so that we can pull some data from there. Um, and then, you know, continuing to put it in the newspapers, continuing to put it in um, the, digi you know, the, the, I, I don't, what did you call it, Robin? The, the sign. <laughs> the, the digital the, sign. Yeah, the, the digital, digital sign. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe but, even just, did you know we have a sustainability action committee, or mm -hmm. did you know we're making a plan? Give feedback. It could even be in the uh, on the website. Could be. I think it would be really cute, and I don't think it would be that hard to do, is to have different members of the sustainability committee do like a compilation of "Did you know." Did you know that Tarpon Springs has 46 miles of shoreline, you know, the Dory says or something, and then showing a, a map of all the, all the, you know, the rivers and everything else. And then someone else says, did you know that the most common tree on most of our, on most of our shoreline is the, is the mangrove? Did you know the red mangrove actually rebuilds shoreline? Did you know that that's our city tree? Did you know, I mean, it could be a theme that's a two minute or not even a two minute, like a, a 45 second video that rather than a clip of a presentation, something that people could just like, uh, you know, look at a YouTube and kind of get it and um, then be done with that, you know, and, and it, it doesn't have to be ongoing, but just to kind of something to engage people with the sustainability committee as something that's intriguing or things that might, um, you know, like talking about what Renee mentioned earlier about restoring the tree canopy. Do you know restoring a canopy of a city can, you know, reduce our emission, whatever it is, you know, and, and uh, but something that is more actively engaging with our website and then collect data as well, but kind of give people a very low rung of a ladder to get engaged on where it's, we go to them first to, to encourage them to be interested in this rather than immediately have, you know, a lot of data for them to process and all our, what we think is important. And then, you know, that, that to me is like, it might be overwhelming for people to say, well, as Dory mentioned, what do I know? I'm just, you know, just, hmm. So those are just a few random thoughts. I, I like those random thoughts a lot. I think that's a great idea. Um, it makes it, it will make all of us more human and more accessible and approachable. I think when we finally do have those virtual meetings. So and filming starts tomorrow. <laughs> I, I totally agree, Robin. I think that that's great, and that's what I did not convey well. But I was trying to get at. I think every, if everybody took one of their shoreline sea level rise and made a little, just a really short video clip, and then we can put those on Facebook too. And, and that uh, would be an easy way to draw people back to the website. I mean, like 20 seconds is the attention span of the average Facebook user. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea though of getting, of, so people could get to know us as we're residents, we live here, we're interested in this, we're regular people who just have a passion for this. And, uh, as, as us extending a warm hand to them to engage in this, you know? 
Well, let me do a read back here of just a few things. I think we're going to need to work on this in pieces uh, that we have a sustainability committee and um, uh, a little bit more about how to get involved and um, that we want people to be involved. And then I'll start looking at how we could do video snippets, um, different committee members talking about a particular area and put that on our website. Is that two of the main actions we can keep going with? Uh, I liked Karen's idea of, did you know we have a sustainability um, committee, but then just a little blurb after all of the different things, did you know that we have 46 miles of shoreline? You know, after each of those little headings that mm -hmm. were that are high priorities. Yes. So maybe Karen, maybe you can write what you had just said um, out. Sure. I would because say I, because that that makes it um, it makes it personal in a way of how it's of how all those little features are fact features of our city are going to affect us all okay. as a community yeah I don't I don't mind doing that um do you want want me to just have it um am I able to send it like to Paul Paul am I able to send it to you and you can kind of redraft or what have you like if you give me yeah. I don't know to, you know to the to next week to get that to you yeah, and then maybe we can come up. okay I just want to make sure that we're playing playing fair <laughs> if I draft that and send that to you and then tweak it and maybe by the next meeting we'll be in a better position with that. And then maybe also start to put together what the questionnaire would look like to gauge people's interests. Great. Is that enough then for you to go on, Paul? Yes, thank <laughs> I you. I think that we all were able to like get to where we are just now with, with that really good conversation. No, it's great. I kind of expected it would go like that. A lot of different input. Um, in this next item, Dory, I'm glad we're getting to it with enough time. It's very important to me that I hear from each of you before I go to the board. And this is sort of our last chance to do that. So uh, Dory, I'll get, turn it back to you to introduce it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So um, the next item is the Duke Energy um, Clean Energy Connection Solar Program. And Paul's going to walk us through the, the highlights of the program. And, um, and I will quickly turn it back over to you. Thank you. So this is night of screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Can everybody see that okay? Nothing there yet. So yes. good. I'm, I hope I zoomed it up so I don't strain anybody's eyes. Um, this is really, I think, an opportunity for us. Uh, I've been working with different organizations that represent cities and local governments throughout the state, actually, like the Sustainability Directors Network. Um, They've been helping on this tremendously. And then we've got a sustainability group based out of Pinellas County's leader there. And um, probably about eight cities in our area talk regularly on that. So what I'm presenting to you, um, I wanted you to know is based on really not just my opinion, but um, a pretty good consensus. I also talked with the person at Duke her name is Stacy Phillips that is spearheading this program. And I actually had her review this memo before I uh, sent it out to you. So this does represent accurate information. And um, I'd just like to go over it. There's a lot to digest here. I was hoping that I got it to you early enough that you had a chance to read it. Um, but I'll just try to cover just enough to give you a sense of what it's about. Walking uh, through the memo in, in order, what. I'm going to recommend we do is go to the Board of Commissioners and the city manager is supportive of this. In fact, he wanted me to present it to you all to um, bring this so that I can mention that um, you all uh, hopefully support it when we're done talking about it. So the recommendation would be for the August 11th agenda 
and we would recommend to authorize subscription of up to 100% of eligible electricity demand. And what that means is do 100% of your metered electrical usage. So um, we've sort of estimated what that is for the city, and you'll see that a little further down in the memo. But what I really think is important to note is there's very little commitment or risk involved. And you don't see these types of opportunities very often where there's really no downside that I can see. Um, at most, we'd be on the hook for one month's subscription, which would come out to about $121 um, after the credits are accounted for. Mm -hmm. So um, very low risk. What we're really asking to do is be reserve a seat at the table. The consensus that I'm getting is this is going to be oversubscribed, meaning that um, already I have an estimate from our group within the area of about almost 150 megawatts being requested. Now that's still a draft at this point, but just keep in mind, there's only 75 megawatts available for local governments. So already we would get reduced by 50%, whatever we asked for, assuming they went with a pro rata reduction like that which is what I understand they're gonna do. So a little bit about the program. Um, it's a new program for them. It's where we would have a subscription basically to their solar uh, power program. Um, there's a real utility scale to this whole thing. Of course, at that scale and where they choose to put it is gonna be way cheaper than anything we could ever build in our densely populated area. You know, you're talking about large open areas of land where they can put just acres of solar panels. Um, they're talking about stepping it up over a three year period to get to their 750 megawatt goal starting in 2022. If we sign up and um, say we wanna subscribe, then we wouldn't be built until the first parts are built, which is estimated to be 2022 right now. Um, how it works, um, we would subscribe by blocks of kilowatt power and we would be charged on our monthly bill at $8.35 per kilowatt of capacity. So just so you know, we're looking at somewhere over 6,000 kilowatts there's a spreadsheet a little further down that does all the math, but that then we get paid back in terms of credits by how much the part that we've subscribed to produces. And they assign a four cents per kilowatt hour to that. And it actually starts to escalate after you've been in the pro program for three years. They've done a, uh, and they've estimated the scale up. I'm at the top of the page right here. 20% um, in 22, then they're going to scale up to 60%. This is cumulative in 23, and 100% of the 750 megawatts would be in 24. So I'll jump down to the little figure here. It just shows you the green line across the uh, bottom there is the cost. It's just showing a, over a 30 year plan they have that the cost to be in the monthly subscription is levelized but the credits do increase over time. So the difference between the blue line and the green line represents actually an increasing savings by being in the program. I make a note here in italics at the end that in addition to the credits, a real benefit is the avoided cost of us trying to build that equivalent solar capacity uh, with individual projects. I don't even think we could really based on what we have, but also the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions associated with the renewable energy. Um, so I talked to you about the calculator tool. Here it is. This is actually Duke's spreadsheet. All I have to do is type in the number in the yellow box at the top and it cranks out everything else. But um, I won't bore you with all the columns, but if you jump over to the far column at the right, that's the cumulative payout. So in year one, we've paid in $1,460. This is cumulative. So um, you'll see the numbers, those are negative numbers in parentheses. And then by year seven, the green box, we're actually breaking even, coming out of the hole, if you will. And the hole never really was that deep. I mean, it, what does it peak out at $18,000 uh, invested in this whole program? Um, and then it starts to go up by year seven. By year 10, we've actually made 
$91,000 by being in the program. And this continues on to year 30 and the number is quite large by the end. It's, it's like over $2 million that has accumulated by being in the program all that time. But that's really not why we're recommending it. It's basically a program that allows us to be part of supporting solar energy at the utility scale. And it doesn't really cost us anything. In fact, it makes us a little bit of money back over the years. So that's a summary of it. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts that um, you wanna start out with? So is this just the city or is it going to be for residential um, as well? Because I thought I saw city and residential in the document somewhere. But. That's correct. There are different allocations for the program. Um, you see the 750 megawatt total. Well, only 10% of that is going to us as the local governments. There's also um, a portion for residential. There's a portion for low income that they've set aside. So yes, it's quite a comprehensive program. Uh, Paul, first of all, um, I think it's really nice to be asked to weigh in on this as a sustainability committee. I appreciate that very much. You sent out or had Irene send us um, some highlighted questions today. Um, do any of those alter your feeling about this being a good deal? Um, does the concern about, for example, um, six municipalities have already weighed in, um, so we're probably not gonna get anywhere near 100%. Does that dissuade you at all? No, um, and that's a great question. I was looking through that information with that same thought in mind. Um, and I, I, it doesn't change my opinion. There's just more information presented. I really see us as having two choices. Either we could say, you know what, I'm not quite convinced about this and I'm just gonna wait. But I think there's gonna be so many other people rushing in that will never really get a seat at the table. And I think that would be a shame. Um, I feel this is just an estimate that we're probably looking at less than 50% of what we ask for. Even at that, even if we got 10% of our total energy usage, I mean, that's still, um, you know, 600 kilowatts of uh, solar capacity. And to put that in perspective, our whole RO plant, if we build every phase is less than 500 kilowatts. Mm. So just 10% of what we're asking for would be more than what we can build on site, if that makes sense. And by the way, I wanna say, I'm not saying this is a substitute. I still wanna keep going with the RO plant solar and other programs. I know some of you have some ideas on how we can do some of our own community solar. And I think we need to be open to those ideas. But this is really a way to get in at some utility scale um, impact, positive impact at a very, very almost nominal cost. Okay, I, I think anytime you can get an ROI of seven years, you ought to do it. I think it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna ask you about whether this would limit how much solar you wanna put at the RO plant. And apparently you just said no. So <laughs> I don't see a downside here at all. I think we ought to do it. Great, I appreciate that. And I would agree after our email conversation, I feel that there's room to be doing other things locally. I mean, I know that when, I, I can't remember, there, there is a mathematical um, formula for the reduction of, um, be, based on distance of what you're actually using. But um, the point is, as a citizen of Florida, we're contributing to more solar being used than other dirty uh, forms of energy production. And we're getting a reduction on our bill based on what we contribute to the program. That's, is that what I understand? That's correct. So we're, even if it's long distance, you know, and we're not directly uh, being solarized in our use here, <laughs> we've got the opportunity to be doing local programs 
And then we've got the opportunity to be growing clean energy in the state of Florida, which makes total sense because we are the sunshine state and we're really underrepresented in our solar use for energy. So I think it's a great idea. Can you state again, Paul, because um, you said that there's about 151 megawatts from our area that, that would be wanting to subscribe. How many megawatts are coming from the city? Uh, we're estimating somewhere about 6,500, 6,500. Okay, thank you. And so we'll presumably, well, who knows what we'll get, but if we assume 50%, then maybe we get half of that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, and a tremendous amount. It's a tremendous amount of energy. Yeah. Do folks have other questions for Paul or? Can we do a motion, Dory? That's what I was gonna. I was kind of waiting to see. Um, can can I would like to entertain a motion um, to. Um, to support this initiative uh, to the BOC. Is there someone that was willing to do that? I move to support it. Second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Karen, you were <laughs> muted. I don't know. We appreciate your input, and um, this is a great uh, vehicle for sustainability committee to um, to weigh in. I think this is something that fits right in with what we're doing. So thank you. Yes, Rory. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, very good. So that was a unanimous vote. All right. Um, well, thank you for bringing that to us. I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to weigh in on it as a group. Um, our next item on the agenda is items for um, for next, next month's agenda, and um, I have some thoughts on that. Sorry, I I moved it when I moved the other. Um, and I think that we had. Uh, we need to um, start with the um, the presentations. I think that it would be a good idea to, to do that, um, just plan that ahead of time. And I believe that was going to be um, a, conver a presentation from um, Public Works. Public Works, there we go, thank you. And then I really apologize. I don't know what I have done with my- That's okay, I've got them in front of me, Dory. If you'd like me to read um, some thoughts here and uh, you correct anything. I've got minutes that we'll have from this meeting, then public works presentation, Tom Function, and then following up on staff presentations from today, anything that you've asked me to look into or answer questions on the planning and zoning or the grants. And then I've got the community engagement back up for another discussion again. That's probably a pretty good start. Thank you. Yes. And as you were talking, I found my notes. <laughs> and that's, uh, that is what I have as well. Is there anyone that would like to add anything to that agenda? I think it's pretty um, ambitious. I was honestly really happy that we got through <laughs> everything we did tonight. I just have a question on what is the next step? We've worked on the introduction to the sustainability action plan. So are, are we going to start working on uh, the body or the meat of the, of the plan individually? Yes, we talked about that and we were trying to weigh out between making more progress on community engagement versus the SAP. And we thought the community engagement had probably a higher priority right now before we get too far down the road on what we think you know, we need to work on in the meat. So I think the work we've done on the introduction, we can use that as a springboard to start communicating with the public 
And uh, based on that input back, and Dora, you, you correct me, but I feel like we'll use the community input to help us start to really put the, the details together. Yes, and I also think that the, um, the presentations from city staff, so we had talked, like, uh, like we just said, about having um, public works for the August meeting, um, also having a presentation about the tree canopy, um, and, and there are other present, you know, presentations and information gathering that, that will um, continue to go on before we jump back into um, right. the plan itself. Thank you. Okay, so then I think we've got the agenda pretty much set for the August meeting. Um, I would like to go ahead and move along then to public comments. Are there any uh, members of the public that would like to speak? At this time, we have no public in attendance. And did we see, we, we, I don't believe we received any email correspondence either this past month. We have not. Thank you. All right, um, then I would like to turn it over for staff comments. Um, I've, got, I've got one. Many of you have sent to me uh, revised parts of your introductions, but some of you haven't. Those of you that still want to go back and make some edits to those introductory parts, you know, some of it may be reducing things down to uh, what, the, what the group has talked about. I would really appreciate that. That's um, going to help me as I keep working on this living document with Ashley. Um, so I'll just put that out there to you. If you would get back to those things and sometime in the next few weeks, send me an email. If you're unsure about whether you need to do anything else um, or want some input on it, I'm here to help you. So you can call me or email me and I look forward to talking to you, but thanks in advance. All right. Um, and then the last item, our committee comments. So I'll open the floor. I, for one, am looking forward to the letter going out with the utilities so that we have people at our meetings. <laughs> and we get emails from the public. That'll be a very exciting day. Thank yes, you. Yes, the, the crickets are loud right now, aren't they? I know. I guess we're just not super chatty tonight. Any other? Um, I appreciate those comments, Denise. Thank you. Anybody else have um, anything they'd like to add? All right, hearing none, um, I would just like to say thank you guys for your attention tonight. I know that we went through quite a few items and um, just continue to be really impressed with um, how we're able to, to work together and, and come up with some good ideas for moving the city forward. So thank you to um, Paul as well and city staff for helping us to uh, stay engaged with all these different opportunities that are coming up. I'm really excited about the solar um, project. Uh, I think that that program is really gonna help the whole of the state to, to meet um, our transition to clean energy. So very excited about that. And thank you, Paul, for, for helping us to, to be part of that, so. All right, well then um, I guess we will go ahead and adjourn a little bit early. It's uh, 7.54 and um, call the meeting to the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.